All right, this is video number one on arm swing, and hopefully you've watched the intro video to pick up some of the language uh, on gears. I've been talking about five gears throughout these videos. And when I look at arm swing, it's kind of like looking at a painting to me in the sense that the arm swing is really what jumps out at me first. It's like in the foreground. So when we look at a painting, we typically see what's in the foreground first. And that's usually where I begin with the runner in a running one-on-one -on -one session. And admittedly, it's relatively uh, speaking, it's the easiest corrections to make. Uh, I do understand that a lot of times in sports, about, you know, I say 50% of the times in sports, we can try to make a mechanical or technical or form correction just by making the athlete aware, just by thinking about it. They say, oh, I, I wasn't aware of that, coach, thank you. And then they can make the correction easy enough. But another time, 50% uh, of the time in sports, we have to address the underlying muscular or neuromuscular issue that's going on. And that is a preface to say that often what I see in arm swing, if there has to be a correction made, I mean, sure, 50% of the time, it's just like a coordination issue. You know? they, no one's ever told them before what they're doing. You make them aware and it's corrected. Other times, the arms are really a byproduct of what's going on with the lower body. The arms are compensating for maybe some instability or inconsistency in the actual running stride itself. And I'll give you two quick examples. Example one, and you've all seen some runners out there, um, it's usually female runners, and I'll explain why, who run with their elbows out nice and wide. And I won't get too far away from the camera, but from a rear view, you run behind some of these runners in a race. So the reason for that is because it's socially unacceptable to run with their arms straight out. Well, why on earth would they want to do that in the first place? Because if you have a runner who runs like on the line, I have this red line here, and the steps they take always come down on the center line, and or if they have weak glutes, which is responsible for balancing, and or if they have weak feet, which is the only thing that hits the ground when you run, and or, again, a lot of females who have uh, wider hips that come in to the knees, they call that the Q angle, so it's a, you know, it's a wider angle, any combination of those factors just means that the brain senses either consciously or subconsciously that there's some instability going on. So this arm swing out here, you can correct, hey, keep your arms in. Great, thanks coach, got it. And then after a couple of minutes, there they go again, okay? Because you're having to compensate for what's going on down here. So until you correct the foot strength and or the glute strength and sure everything else up and down the kinetic chain, you're still gonna see those elbows kind of shoot out, kind of like a tightrope walker to balance, like a cat uses its tail to balance. Um, so that's one example. All right, other examples. Uh, arm swing issues could also be the result of a poorly worded article that had good intentions, it just had the wrong key phrases, and or the person reading the article really misinterpreted the point of the article. And I think uh, one we can all certainly see there is uh, the instruction to run with your arms at 90 degree angles. And I don't like that expression, and here's why. And I've been misquoted by a uh, magazine before saying, Coach Hamburger says, hold your arms at 90 degrees when you run. And I was like, no, that, that's not what I said. We want a relatively compact arm swing. So what I'm looking for is the arm swing to be probably somewhere slightly less than 90. But I do try to stay away from 90 degrees um, specifically because 90 degree angles has a very special place in our minds from what we were taught in school about having to get that angle perfect. And I've seen this. A lot of runners then have really stiff um, neck, shoulder, stiff in the arm swing when they run because they're trying to hold their arms right at 90 degrees. And I know you've seen some of those runners running around your city. So I just say, you know, somewhere less than 90, you get individual freedom, but that will keep it uh, much more relaxed um, swinging to and fro. And usually what you also get with the 90 degree arm swing is the blades. Instead of the hands being in here and being relaxed, you get these blades shooting out here. And that puts just a lot more tension in the arm that works its way all the way up when you're running for longer and longer distances. So coaches, uh, try not to tell your athletes to run at 90 degrees 
or if you do and you see the tent arm swing, it was probably the mentality of 90 degrees. And second example, it's not the main point, but just another example, is a lot of times, especially when we see runners hit fourth and fifth gear, they have a really constrained arm swing. When you have like a constrained arm swing, meaning they, they intentionally, usually it's intentionally, they don't put it through a great range of motion, that creates these little short choppy strides in the feet. Um, or really short choppy strides in the feet will cause the arm swing to also stay short and choppy. So I don't have a big runway here, but I'll try to just demo really quickly what I mean. So they kind of have, have that stride. So um, if I got it backwards the first time, what I really should emphasize is that it can be cause effect either way, but the short choppy stride is causing the short choppy arm swing. So again, as a coach, you can tell them to either blue in the face to correct the arm swing. But if there's a reason for the arm swing being that way, that they're so wound up in the hips or the hamstrings that their leg is constrained in that type of stride, you're never going to correct the arm swing. So it's like a tennis example. You can tell a tennis player all day long to get the racket back and they can say, I'm trying coach, but that, that's all I got. You've got to address some kind of issue going on in this area, then they can get the racket farther back and swing. So 50-50, sometimes you can think about it, correct it, sometimes you've got to address the other issues. All right, so an expression I use in correcting arm swing or actually teaching arm swing from square one is the hip and cheek phrase. That from a side view, uh, one hand is up by your cheek, the other hand is down by your hip. So as you rotate your arms in a sprint, and I often start with sprint mechanics first, hip and cheek, hip and cheek, hip and cheek. So this would be a fifth gear arm swing. A Little bit of room for individual variance there. And then as I cut that down to a fourth gear arm swing and cut it down even more, Here's your jogging arm swing. So pretty much um, gears one, two, and three have the same arm swing. You're gonna pump them a little bit more in gear three, but you really don't need to pump your arms per se until you get to fourth gear. But as we all attempt to clean up the, the wishy-washy side to side, the left and right hooks, the, the pirate walk arm swing, um, you know, a lot of other things that go on when people run, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the point is if we can teach this hip and cheek arm swing, what we also get with that is a nice gentle diagonal. So that gets into another expression I see written in these articles that I, I don't think is, is the correct language. Because when you tell a runner to move their arms straight up and back, I mean, I can feel that already. It's putting a lot of extra work on my shoulder to rotate the hands out a little bit and move it straight up and back. It's more natural to come in with a gentle diagonal. This is a more efficient arm swing, even though my arms are actually, it's like they're pumping a little bit, this is like gear three or four. So what these articles are trying to do is to get you to not cross the center line of your chest, right? We don't want all this extra arm swing side to side. You can still do that with hip and cheek because now you're just at a gentle diagonal, but the instruction to move your arms straight front and back is gonna to lead to too much tension in the shoulder. And also what the hip and cheek arm swing does is it does allow your hand to go down to your hip in fifth gear and almost in fourth gear. But what it does is it gets rid of these long levers that some people run with their arms way down here. I understand their mentality. Maybe they got it from a different article that said drop your arms when you run because this works your bicep. Well, your bicep's supposed to be able to stay in this relaxed, curl position for a very long time and every now and then if you need to you just shake out your arms. But we learned why uh, this long arm swing is not as efficient uh, for the same reason why some of you punch really far forward when you run. So either this or this creates longer levers. And you remember from one of your high school science classes potentially that longer levers just aren't as efficient as shorter levers. And if you are going to move your longer levers with the same speed and rate as a shorter lever, it takes a much bigger uh, generator and battery pack to do that. So your shoulder or your neck ends up paying the price, which is counterintuitive because the whole reason you drop your arms was to conserve energy. 
So start with fifth gear, learn how to sprint, or you can even just get on the uh, ground instead of doing the medicine ball twists, just keep your feet off the ground and pump in fifth gear, gentle diagonal. And then fourth gear, you cut it down a little bit, and then gears one, two, and three are right in here. Where the expression I use is keep your wrists by your ribs. So your wrists are that wide and your ribs are that wide. So in gears one, two, and three, the front or back end of your wrist is never really too far away from the front or back end of your ribs. And finally, last point on arm swing, another expression that we see in the articles is to keep your arms close to your body. And a lot of runners will read that and they say, okay, good, got it, book closed, and whoop, they lock in right in here. And now you can't see any daylight, I'll do it in reverse, but you can't see any daylight between their arm and their body. And sometimes they're locking in and they're so rigid that you'll start to see the shoulders like kind of swing side to side. The brain's not sensing this opposite arm, opposite leg swing that we're accustomed to. It's sensing no arm movement. So from a rear view, uh, coaches, if you watch your runners from a rear view and you see that one elbow, it's usually just one elbow wrapping behind their body. I'll try to demonstrate here. Got this arm kind of wrapping around. It just might be the result of them keeping their arm too close to their body. So I want to see some daylight between your upper arm and your body. We don't want this, that's the first example I let off with, but we don't want this either. So it's never one or the other. I'm always coaching in betweens, it seems like. And there's your nice gear one, two, and three, gentle diagonal arm swing. I understand the mentality of the article, it's to conserve energy with your arms when you run, but just be careful with the specific language that you're using.